Hey up everybody and welcome back to Yorkshire Fab Shop. If you need that one explaining, I'm sorry to say you're in the wrong place. There's a cup of tea in hand, need I say more? Today then, we're going to be diving headfirst into the world of MIG welding. Yes, we're going there. And we're going to try and cover a lot of ground while doing so. So well, I'm going to try and take you through, take you all through the basics and attempt to dispel a lot of the myths and false information that's surrounding this process because there's a hell of a lot of it out there. It's not there to trip you up, but with this we want to be right. And I'm going to try and bring all the good information together that's out there because there is a lot of good information. It's just not all in one place. So that's the idea, that's the goal today is bring all this together and we've got one video that covers everything. Make sure you've got hot tea on tap because this is going to be a bit of a long one, I've got a feeling. There's going to be a lot of talking from me, so if you're bored already, then I won't stick around because there's more where that came from. So what's the topics we're going to cover today? Well, first of all, we're going to start with the basics. So what is MIG welding? How does MIG welding work? The basics, how to properly set up a machine, why it's important to have a proper setup, and then how to run beads and join pieces of metal together. So... If this appeals to you, then stick with us and hope you enjoy. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, we need to briefly talk about health and safety. Yes, I know, everybody's favourite subject. But it's something that's really important and it's necessary to prevent... <laughs> so first and foremost then, you're going to need a welding screen. Because closing your eyes doesn't cut it. Unless, of course, you need just need to top up your tan. No, I'm kidding. The UV light coming off a weld is very intense and it can really severely sunburn you in a matter of minutes, as a lot of you probably found out. And he'll do. Full face one, I'd recommend over anything else because you want to cover the oil if you cover all your skin. I've got a 3M speed glass. This one being, I can't remember off the top of my head, it's a 9100XX. Great screen, really durable, but they're quite expensive and you can get a lot cheaper they're still going to give you the, the level of protection that you need so that's going to protect you from the arc while you're welding because you only get one set of eyes and anyone that's had arc eye in the past knows why you don't need it again auto darkening ones like this definitely are easy to use and i prefer them but fixed shade ones are as good as any other now to supplement the screen you're going to want a really good pair of safety glasses as well. These get left out a lot. And I don't understand why. Because the MIG welding process is quite a violent one. There's tiny lumps of weld spot literally flying everywhere. And the only thing that's worse than our guy is getting one of them molten lumps of metal in the eye instead. Not what you call everybody's idea of a perfect Sunday afternoon. Especially with a waiting A&E. &E. So with face and eye protection covered. You'll want... A decent pair of welding gloves. Now I'd recommend the thick ones like this because it's easy just to think right I'll put a quick tack here and there no gloves on and if the sunburn doesn't do enough damage the spatter that's flying off almost certainly will and you'll end up crispier than a Sunday roast. Thin gloves clearly are going to burn through so thick leather are the only way to go. Plus you get the arm protection that stops you getting sunburned on your wrists if you've got your sleeves up like I have now. Another area to seriously consider is wearing some flame proof clothing. I'm guilty of it myself, but your favourite pair of Nike trackies are ready to catch a light of the first hint of a spark and you only have to briefly search the internet to find some poor soul that's had to go to A&E to have some laser flesh removed because a fashionable nylon clothing is melted to the skin. So as a minimum, I'd strongly recommend some flame retardant overalls, but trousers and a leather smock are even better. Same with your feet, you're going to want some boots, some proper sturdy leather boots. Steel toe caps are ideal in the workshop because if you drop something on your toes, you're not going to suffer with broken bones. But the final area of consideration is the environment around you. Now if you've got bits of cloth, sawdust, wood, anything combustible, solvents, you're going to want these away from the weld because these can catch fire and it's the same for any hot work to be fair if you don't move these you could end up being the sunday roast 
and you really don't want that sorry to sound morbid but welding hot work it's a dangerous process and you need to look out for yourself also goes without saying that you don't want to be doing this sort of thing in a wooden building a shed because you're just asking for trouble there so think about what you're doing have some sort of firefighting equipment a small extinguishing corner workshop's going to pay dividends if you have an issue so just look after yourself because you never know so with safety covered then we can now learn a little bit more about the mig process and how it actually works like on most other welding processes mig welding is an act of permanently fusing items together using heat and a filler material while shielded in an inert gas mag welding is much the same but you use an active gas such as co2 over an argon or an argon mix although an argon mix is technically mag welding as well but it comes under the mig umbrella really all tends to be grouped in the same pot so whether using co2 argon argon mix you saw mig welding these days so here comes my number one favorite myth mig welding is so easy anybody can do it now although the mig welding appears to be easy i would argue that it's one of the most difficult to do and almost as difficult as tig welding Yes, I appreciate that his point and squirt nature makes it seem a doddle, but to lay a proper quality weld using the MIG welding process is actually quite difficult to those that are untrained or not sure what they're doing. I mean, how many times have you gone to lay a weld on some box section, for example, and it's just literally fallen apart with no effort or force before you've even done what you need to? You, we've all been there, we've all laid a quick tack and it's broken away straight away. Well... The reason for this is incorrect setup, simple as that. And it's down to lack of fusion and lack of penetration. So with MIG welding then, there are three accepted methods of metal transfer. Talking basic here, we don't want to get too complex. The most common being short circuit and it's what we were talking about today. And if you pick up a small home set, it's what you're going to be doing. The other two, which I don't want to talk about are globular and spray transfer, but these tend to be more associated with the higher powered machines and you're not going to have a machine generally at home where you can do this. You need 27, 28 volts and 200 amps plus and your little Clark sets aren't going to cut it, unfortunately. There are a couple of others such as pulse MIG and cold metal transfer, but like globular and spray, I really don't want to talk about these today. If there's enough interest then maybe we can do a video on it in the future but there's plenty of information out there and i don't need to do another one so it must be said there isn't a formal weld procedure for short circuit mig sounds unusual sounds a bit strange yeah i know but the reason for this is because it's impossible to nail down the procedure there are countless ways of laying weld using short arc but there are even more ways to get it wrong because of this you can't sum it up all in one procedure so there isn't one simple as the others there is but we're not going to talk about them but how does the welding process actually work then well if we look at this diagram when the trigger is pulled on the torch what happens is the machine's energized so electricity flows into the machine through the rotary voltage switch into the transformers. The position of the switch will obviously determine the voltage that the machine's producing because of the amount of coils that it activates in the transformer. The gas solenoid is also opened and that allows inert gas to flow through the hose into the torch and out of the shroud. The wire feed motor also starts and this begins to draw wire off the spool in the machine through the torch and out of the end of the contact tip. The wire touches the earth work and creates a dead short between the workpiece and the contact tip. With a combination of current and voltage flowing through the filler wire, it causes the wire to vaporise into small droplets, which are fired at the workpiece, causing it to heat up and melt. If everything's set up correctly, as it all cools down, the workpiece and the weld metal become permanently fused together as one. That's the idea anyway. So now that we understand a little bit about the inner workings of the MIG process, 
let's discuss the machine and its attachments so that we can become familiar with what we are using. My current welder is a Tech Arc MIG, Compact MIG 251, which is a single phase 250 amp set and was featured in the episode 3 of the restoration series, which some of you might have watched. This is a traditional transformer based machine with the added extra of a semi synergic wire control, which I don't like and we'll discuss that shortly. But usually, MIG welders tend to fall into one of two categories. They're either like this one, a traditional transformer based machine which tend to be really heavy, as proved in the last one. They tend to have a couple of advantages, such that they'll weld all day, got really good duty cycles usually, and they've got really basic tech inside, so the likelihood of them failing catastrophically is slim. But, as said, they weigh a ton, they're not easy to move around, they're not very efficient in comparison. The other category which MIG welders fall into is Inverter welders, and these are great because if we compare it to my TIG welder which sat on top, they're about a quarter of the size, they don't weigh anything near as much, about a tenth in this case, I can pick that TIG welder up with one finger, or I can't pick the MIG welder up, and the capacity of them is not too far off, 200 amp TIG, 251 amp MIG welder. These have some really good advantages over the older tech, in that because the inverter and the quite advanced in comparison, you get really good control, fine control over every aspect of the MIG welding process. You get pulse, you get cold metal transfer, you get all these really good processes that you wouldn't be able to get in a transformer based machine. However, the problem with these is don't expect it to last as long as your old transformer set. There's that many electronics inside them that any number of them could fail in a short duration and if you plan on keeping them in a cold garage then definitely make sure they're wrapped up in a blanket and put to bed on the night because they don't like the cold and damp. Anyway, I digress. So starting at the top then, on and off switch, simple enough. Beneath them we've got the course and the fine volts. Of course we've got one and two, but in two positions, so I'm guessing that a four pole switch were cheaper than a two. I don't know. Next we've got the fine volts. So this is like your in-between volts. Set it to one. And then you've got range from one through to six of fine volts. Two being the next step up. And then you've got one through six again. So lowest setting being one and one. Your highest setting being two and six. Simple enough. Because this is 250 amp machine and we start at something like 30 amps from memory. Each voltage setting gives us an approximate increase of about 20 amps. Lastly, in this little section, again conveniently labelled, we've got wire speed. And this is what we were talking about semi synergic for, because this isn't as simple as a 1 being the slowest, a 10 being the fastest. And I'll explain. So, when you're talking about synergic welding, you're usually referencing inverter based machines, where you tell it what you're welding. And it spits out some parameters. So if you're welding two mil plate, for example, it'll give you a certain wire speed, certain voltage, and then you can adjust it within within a range to suit your needs. Now what this does, because it's only semi-synergic, is if we've got it set to one and one, so one on the coarse and one on the fine, set the wire speed to five. That gives us a, a predetermined wire speed of whatever it is. If we knock this up to a 2 and a 1, so we've gone up to the next voltage scale on the coarse volts, leave that at 5, what we'll find is the wire speed is a lot faster than it was on 1 and 1. So this machine is trying to compensate for the voltage increase without the operator really having to do a lot. And that suits a lot of people. But it doesn't suit me, unfortunately, because if I'm welding on a 1 and a 5, for example, and I found my perfect wire speed is five somewhere between five and six for the thickness of material that i'm welding but my voltage is not quite right so i want to up it to a six and a one so one and six now because the parameters change for voltage setting i now need to fiddle with a wire speed to compensate for the increase in voltage because the increase in voltage gives me an increase in wire speed which i find counterintuitive to be honest i'd, I'd sooner have just a linear wire speed 
where one is the slowest, 10 is the fastest, and then if I do need to make any fine voltage adjustments, I don't have to touch that, because if I knock it back down to 5, the wire speed's too slow now, so I need to change the wire speed again, and it's just, it's just a little bit too confusing sometimes, and I would prefer a linear wire speed, but anyway, can't complain too much, because the rest of the weld is alright. What we also have up here is the Euro Torch fitting, which I'm going to pull off shortly and show you the insides of that. They're featured on a lot of welders, normal fitment for anything other than budget welders or the fixed torch leads. So this will feature on most of the welders you'll come across and it's unusual to find a different fitting. They'll all be pretty much standard Euros fitting type. And then lastly, which you can just see in the bottom, is the Earth Connector. Simple twist fitting, it's fairly standard stuff again, but we'll go through that in a bit more detail shortly. So if we come around to the other side of the machine, whip this cover off, we'll find inside we've got quite a few items. So start with the big one, we've got the wire spool. This is the filler wire, and this is what you're going to be feeding into the weld pool. It's wrapped tightly on a bobbin, so it feeds off nice and evenly, nice and smoothly. Important to note that it's on a braked roller. So to change, we'll undo that. We can slide the wire off. And then we see this braked roller. Important to note that it's got a little location for the wire spool. So this is braked for a reason. It's quite important that that's braked because just to line them up it needs to be braked to supply a slight tension to the wire before it enters the feed roller and the reason it needs tension is because when you pull the trigger the wire feed motor starts to draw wire off the spool so it turns the spool when you stop feeding wire, when you release a trigger, this spool will obviously needs to stop because you can't keep feeding wire through the torch. It needs to come to a stop quite quickly because if it, if it continues to roll on, you end up with slack between the spool and the feed roller, which may not appear to be a big problem at first, but when you feed wire again, when you pull the trigger, the wire feed draws a wire through, it brings the spool back in under tension again, and it creates a really jerky movement where it pulls a wire spool around, you get a little bit of slack, it stops, it pulls a wire spool again, you end up with a wire spool doing this, which if you try welding like that, it'll cause you nothing but problems because you don't have a smooth wire speed, the, the weld will be really hard to maintain because your wire's constantly stopping and starting. So you need a little bit of tension on there so that when the wire is drawn off the spool it draws it off at the same pace nice and evenly and the spool comes to a stop as said so that when you next time you pull the trigger it doesn't have to pull it far before it starts pulling wire off evenly again so next then we've got the wire feed assembly and it in includes quite a few little little items to be aware of so first of all we've got a screw and this is just like a sprung screw it's a tension screw so this provides a clamping force to this lever to clamp the wire in between the feed rollers. We'll undo this a little bit and put, move it away. So what we have in here is a little grooved feed roller. And this has got different thickness, different depth grooves for the different types of wire that you'll be using. So you need to ensure that whatever wire you've got thickness wise, is matched to the roller because if you get different wires if you get wires that aren't matched to the feed roller you can have problems feeding the wire so if you've got a 0.6 millimeter wire in a 0.8 millimeter groove you'll have difficulties feeding the wire so the wire comes from the spool it comes through this sprung guide tube onto the roller and then through into the torch guide tube to lead it into the torch lead just to mention a little point about this is you want this gap to be quite small so the gap between the end of the feed roller and the start of this guide tube 
just so you don't have any issues feeding wire. It's not so bad for the thicker stuff, but the thinner stuff, especially 0.6 mil, this gap isn't very small. You'll end up birds nesting here and it'll just be a waste of wire. It'll cause headaches. And I generally don't like using 0.6 because of that reason. It's just too much hassle. And the disadvantages of using it out far, far outweigh the advantages that you get on the thinner stuff because 0.8 is good down to a mil or less. So yeah, you feed, you feed, your filler wire comes through here. This top roller exerts pressure onto it so that the feed mechanism can drive the wire, pull it off the spool, send it down the torch. There's a way of setting the correct tension, which I'll go through later. But basically you adjust this screw until you've got the correct tension so that the wire feeds down the torch nice and steadily, doesn't damage the feed rolls or the feed roll doesn't damage the wire because that can be a problem as well. If you put too much tension on here, you can damage the wire, which can damage the liner of the torch and cause you problems coming out of the contact tip. Other than that, fairly straightforward. There's not a lot to these. Don't usually give too many problems. Finally, in the bottom, I've got all my consumables here. It's important to know if you're keeping them in there, just make sure they don't get tangled up in the in the uh, in the wire spool because if it gets underneath and starts giving you wire feed problems, then it just adds to the adds to the problems you don't need. So if we start talking about the torch, then quite a few components on here. This is an MB thirty six size torch, uh, recommended for bigger output welders. I think this is somewhere in the region of three hundred amps. Um, rating air cold you can obviously get fancy water cooled torches for the really high output MIGs so they all tend to be similar in design this might not be the same exact one you've got but I've taken it apart to try and demonstrate again these components will be shared although they'll not be exactly the same as I said it's an MB36 I prefer the 25 because it's a little bit smaller easy to handle but that hasn't got an output rate to the max output of my machine so 36 is has got to be the one and i really don't want to be faffing about changing torches over all time so first thing we took off was the shroud so this is just to protect everything so gas blows out of there surrounds the weld pool and contains all of the components this one is a push on type, but you can also get screw types. Next thing we took off is a contact tip. That's a really important piece of kit that because as the wire feeds out of the end of here, it touches a contact tip and creates a circuit between the earth clamp or the work and your torch, this bit. So without that, or with a poor sized or a damaged one you don't get a good circuit between there and the earth clamp so you may have problems with your welding these are obviously available in all sorts of different sizes for each type of welding you're doing so you can even get different materials this is copper but you can get different materials of them again different sizes depending on wire thickness next we have the contact tip holder this does nothing really other than direct the wire into the contact tip and just hold that in place at the right distance from the end of the torch. So they're sized with the correct thread to fit your contact tip into. The next piece is a diffuser. So this is a ceramic diffuser and that sits right inside the bottom of the shroud. And this is where the gas is allowed to escape from. So it comes out of these little holes through the diffuser, and then that blows it through the shroud to the point of work. That's obviously a push on type, and they don't always include them. So if you've got a smaller torch, you won't necessarily have one of those, but just thought I'd show you that. On this one so last thing to look at is the torch body itself these screws will come out and this cover will come off I don't want to do that because I don't think there's any value in it but this holds a swan neck 
which is removable and replaceable. It also holds the trigger switch and supports the rest of the rest of the torch hose and cable that comes out the end of it. Designed to be comfortable, easy to use, especially with big gloves on. Like I said, the 36s are a bit bulky, but we need one rate to the machine's output. So the swan neck, the wire and the gas will come through here and feed the wire out through contact tip holder, through a contact tip to the point of work and then obviously the gas will flow on the outside of that, out of the diffuser, through the shroud to the point of work. The Euro torch then. We've got a collar on here which is threaded. So you unscrew this and you can pull the torch plug out. So that's the threaded collar which goes onto here. On this back face, this flat face, that physically touches here and that's your electrical connection between the welder and the weld. We've also got two little sprung connectors in there and they create the circuit between the trigger and the welder. So you pull the trigger, this is what transfers that signal down into your welder. We've also got this connector which has got a little o-ring on. So this is for your gas. So the gas comes through the solenoid into the back of this connector and through here to your torch. It's important to note this o-ring needs to be in good condition because if you get leaks then that will cause you problems with your weld. We've also got the wire guide and the wire liner. So take this off quickly inside here. That's the wire liner. I don't want to pull that out because it's a pain to refit it but they're replaceable so if they get damaged you can swap it out for another one. And conveniently there's only one way that you can install this, so you can't really get it wrong, but basically shove it in, a little bit of pressure, and screw the collar on. Make, it, make sure it's nice and tight. You don't want this loose because if that contact face isn't touching, you'll get an electrical arc in there which will damage the face, so it'll not only damage the torch, but it'll damage the machine face as well and sometimes it can be difficult to get hold of for this machine i haven't been able to find a replacement one so that if that got damaged i'd be pretty stuck to be honest so that needs to be nice and tight we know and good contact in there the final detail on the front of the machine then is the earth clamp or the earth socket in this particular case probably the simplest bit here just a half a turn just to undo that fitting like a bayonet type fitting so we've got a little raised section on there which aligns into a slot in the plug so you push it in turn it half a turn and that's it fitted nice and easy these are available in a couple of different sizes this is a 35-50 for this machine or well, you can get bigger ones for bigger output machines Officially these are called DINS connectors, but they're available in all sorts of different types. So I've got them like a screw clamp type, I've got a manky old crocodile clip style, but you can get them as magnetic blocks or like G clamps. So depending on what you're welding, there should be an earth clamp that's suitable for your project. Now that we've covered the major aspects of the machine, we're finally going to talk about the actual welding process. There are a number of factors that apply when using any weld process and these are, in no particular order, correct voltage, correct amperage, appropriate amount of filler material, correct or proper angle of the torch or electrode depending on what process you're using, adequate travel speed and finally the correct distance between the torch or electrode and the workpiece. With MIG welding there are a couple of things you can adjust. But like any of the other processors, it's really important to get the settings that you can correct. And this eloquently brings us on to the next myth when MIG welding, and it's that voltage sets the power, then wire speed is adjusted to suit. I can't tell you how frustrated it makes me whenever I hear this, because you could not get this any more wrong. I mean, don't believe me? Well, let's prove it with a simple demonstration then. Welcome to... The Miginator 2000!
Oh, that sounds crap, doesn't it? Yeah, I've not actually called this anything yet. I've not christened it properly. Um, if you think of any names, bung them in comments because that were a bit of a weak effort, that wasn't it? Anyway, so this is the contraption that made Heath Robinson look proud in the first video I published. And if you don't know who he is, then Google him. But the idea behind this was specifically with this video in mind. So by using this setup, we can completely eliminate most of the inconsistencies in MIG welding. So we've got a set and positioned torch to workpiece height. So that isn't going to change. We can also set a travel speed anywhere we want. And by using this contraption now, we're going to prove that by simply upping the wire speed and touching nothing else, will actually give us more amps in the weld. Now, at the minute, as you'll see, we are on settings one on the coarse volts and four on the fine volts. I've run a couple of uh, test test runs just to make sure it will actually run the wire speed because we're quite low. I think we're just over four. You'll be able to see it better than I will at the minute, but this is about as low as I could set the wire speed as it would comfortably run. And you'll see now I'll run this weld and we'll look at what sort of amps the machine is outputting. So first things first, apologies for all the trials on here. I've only got one camera, so I've got to do everything twice. Now hopefully that were a good demonstration as to the difference between low wire speed, just right wire speed and too high wire speed. So when we tried to run the low wire speed, which is these couple at the back there, it was only just maintaining an arc. The wire speed was just set so that the wire was only just quick enough coming out of the contact tip to maintain that arc. I mean, we can see we've got a bit of a crap weld as well, but volts, somewhere around 16 volts, amps, 70-ish, just not enough. We then ran too fast of a wire speed, which was this one. Uh, really, really, again, struggling to run an arc. Wire speed was that fast that it was constantly touching the work. You could hear and see that. And as a result, the voltage and the amps were just all over the place. But you saw that they, they actually got up quite high, 550, 160 amps. And then finally, these couple here would run where the wire speed was set something like. We were about 90, 100 amps. Still the same voltage as the low wire speed. So that proves that it doesn't change that parameter. It only changes the amps, the heat input into the material. Still a little low. For welding 3mm, which this is, we could do with another voltage up, maintaining the same sort of wire speed in comparison to the voltage. So we'd up the wire speed a little bit, up the voltage a little bit, and then that'd give us an ideal weld on this thickness. But hopefully that proves to you that the only thing considering the amount of heat input is in fact the wire speed. So in theory, we should be able to run maximum wire speed on this material at the lowest voltage and get the maximum machine amps but i'll explain why we can't do that in just a minute so yeah hopefully that's a good demonstration so it's kind of nice to use a bit of this equipment as well because it's been stood up in corner at garage for ages now and just waiting for this one so why is this then why have we just seen that wire speed makes such a difference on the amount of power that the machine inputs into the workpiece well simply put the more wire that's fed out of the torch the faster the wire is shorting out on the workpiece so the more power 
that can be transferred through that wire into your work. Hypothetically speaking, you should be able to run maximum amps on the lowest voltage setting, but there's a reason that you can't. Well, this is because the voltage is there purely to maintain an arc length. So you've got a certain amount of voltage, certain amount of wire speed, you get a certain length arc. If your wire speed is too high for your voltage, wire is coming out of the torch too fast that the arc can't maintain the length that it wants to. So you end up getting a stubbing effect where the wire is constantly touching the work and then being vaporised and then it happens again and again and again. Conversely, if you've got the wire speed set too low or the voltage too high for the wire speed because they're both the same difference, what ends up happening is it maintains an arc length but there's not enough material coming through the torch to actually lay a decent weld and therefore not enough material means not enough heat into the workpiece so you don't get any melting of the base metal to the weld metal you end up with a really tall weld that doesn't isn't fused properly so there is a fine balance between correct wire speed and correct voltage but how do we know what that is well there aren't any recommended settings normally speaking and if your welder doesn't suggest any then we need to calculate it so for a given thickness of material the amount of power roughly needed to weld it up to a certain size is about 40 amps per mil or one amp per thousandth of material so although it's not set in stone we need a certain amount of wire coming out of the torch to impart a certain amount of current into the workpiece they're not all exactly the same. The thicker the wire, the more power it can transfer, so the less wire speed you need. And there are charts that tell you this. If we're welding, say, an eighth material with 0.8 millimeter wire, we need around 250 inches per minute of wire speed feed to supply about 120 amps of material. So because our power was a little bit low, we might be at just less than that. And we're, we're running one millimetre wire, so there's a difference for difference calculation for that thickness. But there are factors and charts that work all that out for you. So when we've got a welder like this one with no actual values, how the hell do we work out what is wire speed and what is voltage should be? Well, let's show you. To start then, you need to begin by measuring voltage out of the torch. The easiest way to do this is grab a mate who can use your multimeter for you and you need to pick up a place between the torch and the earth clamp that you can actually use to reference for a measurement. So the easiest place I've found is where the main lead joins the back of the euro socket just beyond the wire feed. There'll be a big bolt and a big wire there. Get the positive lead on there and then get your negative lead on the on the ground clamp and then just run a weld. You need a mate to help you because you can't just measure the voltage between the torch and the earth without doing any welding because you'll get an open circuit voltage and that's the state of the machine where there's no welding happening. That'll be a lot higher than the actual welding voltage that you get. So you need to do that for every single setting. So start at one and one or one or whatever your lowest machine voltage is. Do a weld, then move up to the second voltage, measure it, do a weld, and then do them all so that you end up with a full suite of voltages for every voltage setting on the machine. I've got 12, so I'll need to do it 12 times, one for each weld. The wire speed, however, is a little different and it's a bit more of a pain to be honest so what you need to do is set your machine to the lowest wire speed setting mine being a one but i don't think it actually feeds wire on one so you need to wind it up and set it to the lowest setting where it starts feeding wire you then need to set a timer and pull the trigger for six seconds when you've done that, you can measure the amount of wire that's been fed out of the end of the torch in inches or meters, depending on what units you want to use. You then times it by 10 and that gives you 
your total wire speed feed per minute. So I like to work in inches because it tends to be what a lot of the information is quoted online, inches per minute and amps and volts. So I'll go ahead, we'll run this for six seconds and then we'll measure the total wire that's been fed out of the torch and then that'll give us the speed in inches per minute. So as I said earlier, I don't like the Synergic control on this machine and this is one of the reasons why I really can't stand it because if it were a linear scale, I'd just be able to set it at one, measure, set it at two, measure, set it etc etc. Because the wire speed changes relative to the voltage, you have to do every wire speed setting for every voltage. So there's 12 voltage settings, 10 wire feed speeds. So that's 10 wire feed speeds for every bloody voltage, which works out 120 times you've got to do this. If you've got to do it that many times, what you certainly don't want to be doing is feeding the wire for six seconds, snipping it off, feeding it for another six seconds, snipping it off, because that's just a waste of wire. So what we'll end up having to do is feed it out for six seconds, measure it, wind it back in by hand, feed it out again for six seconds, etc, etc. Also make sure you've got the gas on. I have turned the bottle off, but I've not emptied the line yet. So my machine starts feeding wire at just over four. I'm going to snip this off so that I can feed it back into the torch. So we'll go for six seconds. So at the lowest setting then, that feeds in six seconds one and a half inches. So 1.5 inches times 10 is 15 inches. So that is 15 inches per minute. So I'm going to wind this back in so that it's level with the end of the shroud and we'll just try again. So now I've wound it up to 10. So we're at voltage setting one and one. And we're going to go for six seconds again. Now we need to measure that. So we're about, call it 28 inches. So we times that by 10. So on setting voltage one and one, the wire speed feed 10 will be about 280 inches per minute. So we'll do that for every single setting and we'll get a bit of a chart and then we'll be able to calculate what we can do on each setting. This is my machine bible then. I've done all this once already, but I've had to make a couple of adjustments because in the last video you all saw, hopefully, that I'll replace the smoothing capacities in this machine. I'm quite surprised how much of a difference that's made actually. Before I was getting sort of nine volts at the low end, nine for most of them, and now I'm like 13 volts. I'm consistently four or five volts higher than what I was before now that the capacitors are in place. So they really actually do make a big difference. Fortunately, the wire speed hasn't changed a lot. You're always going to get some slight differences in amount of wire fed, depending on how accurate you are with the releasing the trigger after six seconds. But for argument's sake, we're within give or take five or ten inches per minute which is near enough. So this is now going to sit inside the machine where the wire lives and I can just reference this whenever I need to look at thicknesses. So bear in mind that this is one mil wire that we've got in the machine so I'll have to remember that when I'm doing the factoring for the amount of wire that I need I'll have to reference as one mil. But the wire speed should still stay the same regardless of the thickness. So with this chart put together now we can calculate where we need to be on the scale to weld any thickness of material within the welder's capabilities. So we're going to look at welding this 3mm stuff that we are practicing on earlier. Now I know with you using 1mm wire, I need to be somewhere around 150 inches per minute. So I'm going to be in this region. If we look at setting sort of between 5 and 6 on the 6 and 1. So I think we need to be around the setting five or six. 
But how do we know how much voltage we need? Because we've got 17 volts, 18 volts. What's what's enough? What's too much? What's not enough? Well, as we went through earlier, you need enough voltage to maintain the correct arc length or the, the correct burn back on the wire. So that as the wire is feeding through, the arc length is such that the relationship between the wire fed and the arc length is correct. So think of this as a bit of a Goldilocks. Well, we know that if we're just right, we'll get a nice well, but if it's too high or too low, then we're going to get a bit of a crap weld, as proven earlier. Sometimes your wire will actually give you some specifications for wire speed, but it's quite rare. So you're going to have to have a bit of a guess and basically experiment. So we'll do that now. I know that around 115 inches per minute, so that's like between six and seven on this voltage, six and seven on that voltage, five and six on that. So I'm going to have to set these each time. And we'll be able to watch the little display on the, on the machine so we know when we're getting the right sort of amperage. Um, and we can go too little, too high, and we can see what the difference there is. So we'll get the rig set up again and we'll run some welds on this and try and find out what we need. The plan then is to have a bit of a play with the voltages, try and show you the difference between not enough volts, just the right amount of volts and then too many volts. So we'll start off with not enough volts which should be the same as too much wire speed. Apologies the video were a bit crap there. I don't have very good facilities for recording welding. So, ignoring that one, all these four were all recorded at the same wire feed speed. And as a result, all produced about the same ampage. It were all 120 amps, give or take. This one being the lowest voltage, you can see is really peaky. It's got really bad tie-in. It looks like it's just been laid on there as opposed to actually sinking into the material. As it started to warm up a little bit towards the end, you can see that it's sunk in a little better, but far, far from ideal. The second one, the next voltage up, we've started to get a little bit of better tie-in. Still really high, really narrow bead. So still not ideal. Then we move on to the third voltage setting, which as it happens were 6 and 1 I believe, so we're at the higher end of the scale. This one has got a lot of air tie-in, it's a bit narrower, it's sunk in a lot more. Uh, reasonably good profile, no spark, because that's the important thing, because this is the difference here, we, we knocked it up two more voltage settings for this one. And although it's bitten in well, we've got quite a lot of spark in comparison to the other couple where there were none at all. So that's one telltale that the voltage is set so high is that the spire is excessive. And I don't believe you could see it from the footage, but you could really tell the difference between the arc lengths from the smallest to the tallest. Like the physical arc length were much bigger at the higher setting than it was at the lower setting, which inevitably results in excessive spatter. So that's the easiest way to set the voltage. If you don't know what voltage you need, 
you set the wire speed first, follow the approximate thickness of the material, and then just play about with the voltage settings. So if this were as happy medium, that's where we're good, because if I flip this over, three mil, we've got great penetration through the bottom. So this is the, the one I would describe as being the best out of the four. This one has also got good penetration, but at a cost of excess spatter on the top. So poor a B profile at the top, but still bit bit through well. These are the ones you can see that they didn't get through at all. So that's the other difference there is the lower voltage, even though the amps were the same, it didn't punch into the material as much as the other two. So there is a definitely a difference between the correct voltage and either not enough or too high. But they're the differences for you. Now that we've set the welder for the thickness of material that we actually want to weld, we can now go on to welding two pieces together. It's always a good idea to have a quick practice on some scrap before you go on to the welding the final products because you want to make sure your settings are correct, you want to lay a good weld and you want it to look nice. So I haven't mentioned it yet and I am going to go into too much detail about it because there are a million other videos out there and there's plenty of information online about it, but there are a couple of choices you need to make before you actually pick your torch up and strike an arc. It should have been about 10 minutes ago, this information, but hey ho, we'll cover it now. So the two things you really need to think about are gas choice and wire material. Because there's absolutely no point having a practice setting up for a weld using an argon mix for gas for example and then switching to CO2 and expecting it to perform exactly the same. It just doesn't work. So the wire will dictate what polarity the, the machine needs to be set at because you might choose to use gasless wire and that uses a conventional or straight polarity where the torch is electronegative and your earth is positive. Generally in mild steel MIG welding with gas it's the other way around, so your torch is positive and your earth is negative. I can't change it on my welder, so I can't run gasless wire. But I don't intend to, so it's not a big deal. But a lot of the smaller welders you can. This can present some issues sometimes because if it's been flipped and not flipped back, it'll give you a really unsightly bead. So it'll be a really tall bead, it won't seem to lay in properly, it won't bite into the base material correctly. So that's definitely something to look for before you actually start welding. For wire then, for mild steel welding, you want to get yourself some good quality ER70S6 from a reputable supplier. I really don't recommend picking up a roll of Chinesium off eBay because you don't know what it is. It might run terribly. It just ain't gonna help the cause. So always buy from reputable suppliers and buy decent quality stuff. For the extra 10, 15 pound it's gonna cost you it ain't worth arguing about. If you're welding predominantly under 200 amps, then I'd recommend some 0.8mm or 30 thousandths wire. Just because you're not going to benefit from anything thicker and the smaller stuff can be a bit of a pain to run. 0.6 is an option like I said, but it can present a whole heap of problems and it's really not a recommended wire for starting out with. I'd maybe move on to that once I've got my hand in. As for gas, I'm using 10% CO2 argon mix but for thinner stuff anything up to five six millimeters I'd recommend anywhere between five and fifteen percent CO2 argon mix and then anything beyond that the 25% CO2 argon mix will be sufficient and that's generally what your typical fab shops use they'll get a 25% CO2 argon bottle for all their general fab work but if you're doing a lot of thinner stuff, then get slightly less CO2 content because it makes your life slightly easier. The other option, because it's slightly cheaper, is pure CO2. And lots of welders use these. There's a couple of advantages to this as well in that it does produce a hotter arc. So if you're borderline on a thickness, say you've got a, I don't know, 150 amp machine and you want to weld some 5 mil, if you switch to CO2, you might just get that. Whereas if you had an argon mix, you probably wouldn't. Unfortunately, it's not the easiest gas to use. And I really don't recommend it on thin panels. If you're wanting to do some panel work on a vehicle, for example, 
I would stay away from CO2 and I would also stay away from gasless wire. Get some 5% or some 10% CO2 argon mix and it should go a lot better. So with these cut now, there's a multitude of way of holding these in place. I'm just going to use a piece of scrap as a third hand just to hold that in place. Put a couple of tacks in and then we'll be able to run a welding. As I said, earthing being quite important so we've got nice bright shiny steel. I'm going to earth directly to the workpiece. Because we, with mid welding, the earth is really important. In absence of a third hand or a, a clamp to hold it, you can use G clamps or magnets or whatever you want, to be honest. So I'm gonna run this, run this weld now. Good practice. I used to snip the end of the wire off. So not a bad weld all in all then. Camera got in way a lot there, so apologies about that. That actually fell off as well, which is why I've had to weld on both sides. But yeah, we're quite happy with that. Looks like it's cutting well. They are coming apart anytime soon, that's for sure. Something to take into consideration when you're MIG welding is if you're doing it especially like a 90 degree joint like this as soon as you start welding it'll want to pull the top over and thin stuff it'll want to warp it all over the place so be mindful that if you're doing the thinner stuff you either accommodate for the pull prior to welding or you have to do a small couple of small tacks then bend to where you need it or tack both sides to try and hold this in an upright position as it cools it, it does pull mix not the worst by far but there isn't a welding process that's particularly that's particularly good it's just some aren't as bad as others and if you're doing particularly thin material like this is three mils so if you're doing like one mil or less there are thin metal techniques that you can use to try and help with burn through and running metal into those joints but there's plenty of examples of that about, so I don't want to spend too much time covering it, but a bit of a back step or a series of smaller runs or tacks will go a long way to preventing burn through and give you a nice bead profile as well. So because we're doing this freehand now, there are a couple of considerations to make with how you're holding your torch and what you're doing with it. So we need to think about torch angle. And the first question that gets asked a lot is, well, what do I do? Do I push or pull? So pushing is where the torch is behind the weld. We're traveling from right to left. So the wire is being fed into the leading edge of the puddle. That's known as a push. If you go the other way, so if we go right to left and feed into the front of the puddle, but drag the puddle with us, that's called pulling. In these couple of examples, I had to push because I feed right to left being right handed and the camera was on my left so I didn't have room to get the torch in with a pulling angle so I had to push but there are advantages and disadvantages to each one of them so if we're pulling then you tend to get better penetration because heat's allowed to build up more that helps with fusion it helps with wetting in but you tend to not get as nice a weld because it can build up a bit more so if you're after aesthetics, then you will probably push, but you might struggle to get as much penetration as you would pull in. Either way, for thinner stuff, you don't make a lot of difference, but if you're doing thicker structural members, 
you might want to think about pulling rather than pushing but if you use the right technique then you should be able to get a sound weld with either. The other thing to think about is if you look at this side on we need to position the torch in between these two angles so because we're welding in 90 degree you want the torch angle to be at 45 somewhere in between because you want to aim heat at both parts equally if you hide too low you'll have more weld on the upright and if you have it too high you'll have more in the bottom and you won't get proper fusion between the two materials and you won't get a strong weld and this also ties into travel speed so we've got a relatively nice bead profile not too much spatter it has to be said so with voltage and wire speeds must have been about right but you've got to maintain the correct speed of weld because if you're too fast as demonstrated if you're too fast you won't get enough weld metal on there you won't get it hot enough and you won't get good fusion and if you're too slow you'll just end up building up a massive ball and it won't help anything Obviously that was too fast, it didn't even wet into the corner, even though I tried my best to, to get it in there. If I lay one that's too slow over the top. See that there's just miles too much weld piling up. If we look at where we began, we aren't getting any tying at all because what's happening is the weld is piling up and then it's running down and it's just settling on top. So that's a really weak joint there because it's not fused, it's just stuck on top. But that shows ink proper torch angles as well because. The first one we just laid along the bottom edge, we didn't get anything into the, into the upright. Hopefully that's given you a bit of a demonstration as to the difference between proper speeds and angle of torches and what you need to be doing with them. So another variable to worry about is something called electrical stick out. This being the distance between the contact tip and the workpiece. It's quite easy to get wrong and it can cause a lot of headaches. If this gap is too big or too small, then it'll affect the weld quality. Too small is not a massive problem because sometimes you can't get near enough for it to be too small. More often than not, it's a problem with it being too long. So your torch is physically too far away from the workpiece. But what this causes generally is a voltage drop. And that affects the length of the arc because as the voltage drops, the arc length gets shorter and therefore the wire speed is too fast because the voltage is too low. So you can have it perfectly set up. You have your torch set too far away and everything just goes to goes to crap. Problem with a weld with too long a stick out is it's just the same as with improper wire or voltage settings. You'll get bad penetration, be lacking in fusion, and it just won't look very nice. Generally speaking, you need a 10 mil give or take space between the workpiece and the torch or the contact tip. Because our contact tip is recessed somewhat in this torch, we've got to get the nozzle or the shroud quite close to the workpiece. On the smaller torches, you don't get so much of a recessed contact tip, so it's not too much of a problem, but just be aware that sometimes the contact tip can be up in the nozzle slightly. So you think you've got a 10 mil gap, where in reality it's more like 15. I'll run a couple of welds. We know what it looks like with proper arc length so I'll bring this really extremely too far away and you'll just see how difficult it is for this to maintain an arc I don't think I'll be able to run a reduced arc very easily like I said because this is recessed up into this shroud but what tends to happen is the wire welds itself to the contact tip and it just ends in tears so we'll run a really long arc length and we'll see how that looks the settings are still the same for this material thickness. 
actually quite surprised how well that ran, really. <laughs> they didn't really do any favours to that argument because that looks like a reasonably okay weld at really a miles too big of a arc length. It probably helps somewhat that we're running one millimetre wire and you don't get as much of a voltage drop with that but I'm pretty shocked yeah that's not really done a lot for the argument what we were expecting to see there is the arc length getting smaller and this arc struggling to run the weld started off okay and it, it seemed like we'd get a really large heat affected zone towards the end so difficult to comment really <laughs> I'm going to have to watch that back and just see what it will like. Uh, so yeah, I've just had a quick look with the powers of editing. I've just had a quick watch of that myself. And it is actually difficult to see why, why, is, why that's wrong. But one thing we must understand is electrical stick out is really important. And you need to keep it relatively small. That's not, in, <laughs> that's not good enough. It needs to be nearer. But we've even, it's even shielded that arc really well. I'm... I'm I'm dead shocked with that, it should, that shouldn't have happened. What we might have to do is increase the arc length even more and then see what happens because that definitely shouldn't have happened like that. Let's try that, let's, let's run an even longer arc and let's see what happens. So this will be like nearly two inches and half an inch is about as much as you want to run. That was a better demonstration. So, as proved there, it wouldn't run an arc. The wire was just overheating and then it'd push it out of the way and it'd do it again. So it had more like a fuse wire there. And that's more what I expected to see in the previous example. So that's obviously ex extreme wire stick out and you would never ever run anything like that. Anyway, so too much of a stick out is really bad and it doesn't always produce a good weld even though we've just sort of disproved that because we can have an electrical stick out of about 40 millimeters and it still seems to run all right on one mil wire. Maybe that's just a compliment to the welder and the setup, I don't know. But keep your stick out short. Right, so the final hurdle then, and the last thing to think about is gas. And like every other variable, it's really easy to get this wrong. So you've gone out, you've chosen your bottle of gas. I've gone for 10% CO2, I've gone mixing my big welder, but you might go for a 5, you might go for a 25 mix, or you might go for a, a pure CO2. Either way, you need to make sure that you've got the right amount of gas for not only your torch, but the weld that you're doing as well. But how do we know how much is right? Well. You might be lucky and with your torch you might get a data sheet and it says you might need 10 to 15 litres of gas flow per minute. 90% of the time you probably won't have that information so you're going to have to guess. But how do you guess? Well, thankfully it's quite easy to tell the difference between not enough and just enough. If you haven't got enough gas you're going to produce a very porous weld. It's going to have loads of holes in it and it's going to have next to no strength. And it'll look horrible as well. This will happen more often than not if you're welding outside and there's a gentle breeze. Or if there's a bit of a wind coming through the workshop. This is basically because your gas provides a shield for the arc. It protects the arc so that oxides and normal air can't get into it to contaminate the weld. So if you've got an improper shielding gas amount, you'll get normal air entering the weld and that's what makes it porous. Too much gas can have the same effect as not enough, but you can't always tell because you think, well, I've got plenty of gas, so it can't be a problem with it flowing. But what happens if you've got too much gas is you can create a lot of turbulence around the weld and around the shroud. And that in itself can pull air into the shielding gas and contaminate the weld. So it's not always as easy to identify too much gas, but if you've got some way of measuring it, which I strongly recommend you do, then it's pretty easy to rule that one out. 
So, how do we measure the gas then? Well, there's two ways of doing it. We've you've got a flow meter, like this one. This one gives us gas flow in litres per minute. With this torch, we need somewhere in the region of 10 to 15, but 10 litres per minute is normally a good place to start for any torch, especially if you're welding indoors. You don't need too much. The other way of doing it is with a pea shooter. Now, this is a bit, bit better designed for MIG welding because the there's, there's shroud will fit on there easily, but that only goes up to about 14, 15 litres per minute. This one goes right up to 20. So if I get the torch, turn the welder on. I've got a flow meter on the on the bottle anyway, so I know what it should be producing. But if I drop this on here, pull the trigger, make sure the wires feeds off as well. You need to wait for the gas to stabilise. And you can measure the amount of gas. So just over 10 litres per minute, which it's just about right. In fact, it's probably a little bit too much actually, because as we saw, even with a really long stick out, it's still shielded the weld area well. But 10 for most things is a nice weld, especially if you're welding something round. If you're welding something round on top, then gas can flow away very easily. So you sometimes need a little bit more in that situation. I would highly recommend getting one of these because the ones on the regulators aren't very accurate. This you can set it very easily. And you can always check it with one of these. And these pea shooters as well. For the money that they cost, they're worth having. But I'll get one of these over anything. And then the only other thing that can affect your weld quality are simple leaks. If you've got a hose that's got a slight weep, that can pull air in. And that can give you a undesirable weld profile or porosity or some welding anomaly that you sometimes can't work out. So... A good idea to do before you do any welding is get a bit of leak detector, some soapy water, spray it over all the joints, even the internal ones because the solenoids have been can leak and do leak, and just diagnose any areas that there's any leakage. Small leaks don't always cause a problem, but it's better to not have any than worry about, well, I had a slight leak and my weld's a bit crap now. We'll do a quick demonstration with welding without gas and you'll be able to see what that looks like then. So if we just look at this weld now then. When we started there was a little bit of gas remaining in the line. I hadn't quite emptied it all. And then within a half a second or so you get this awful nasty weld that's full of holes, full of porosity, it isn't fused into the metal at all. It's just not nice, you get this brown burning hue because you're just burning the wire off as opposed to a nice clean arc. So that's what it looks like when you've got no shielding gas. You can sometimes get areas of this in your weld, you can be going along nicely and then all of a sudden it'll just start. That could be dirty base material or it could just be that you've moved the torch slightly too far away and the gas hasn't covered properly. Or it could be a draft or anything. There's, there's a thousand different ways why you get poros here. But don't let gas be one of them because it's a really simple one to sort. Now that we've successfully welded a joint then, how do you know if it's actually strong enough? To the untrained casual observer, all these three welds probably look alright. That one's not so bad, that one's not so bad, that's a bit worse. Forget about that bit on there. However, I know that that is going to be lacking seriously in fusion. We've got poor tying along the top and the bottom. This area, there's no fusion there because it's just run over. These are slightly better. So without really being able to read the weld, you're pretty stuck. But there is something you can do. And it's called a cutting edge. This involves slicing your material along the axis of the weld to reveal a cross section of what you've done. You then polish it all up, polish it nice, get it shiny. Not with just a grinder, you need some polishing pads to really bring the shine up so that you can see a bit of a reflection. And then you need to treat it with a dilute acid solution. 
the standard stuff is nitric acid I think but there are a few others that you can use such as the rust treatment for car body works and rusty metals they work quite well apparently and I've been told vinegar works but vinegar is really weak I don't think it develop it very well or it might it take too long it take all night so here's one I prepared earlier this is a cut and etch of this so it's some six mil the weld profile itself is pretty good it seems to have tied in nicely in both the top and bottom maybe slight undercutting at the top but it's not bad very little spatter so the settings weren't too bad weren't far off so this is what the acid does it brings out it develops the grain structure of the metal welds being different slightly different to the remaining material so it gives you this little snapshot of the weld nugget what we can see from this is we've got very good penetration on this upright section not as good on the flat bottom section unfortunately now there are a couple of reasons for that I will put good money on my torch angle being too shallow so I was aiming too much into the upright as opposed to the bottom but if this was on a flat bench then the bench would be sucking heat out of the bottom of the material so that could cause issues with the bottom not being allowed to heat up as much as the upright but there are a couple of reasons however what we're looking for is penetration below the line of the material which we've got in both sections it's nice and deep it goes right into the corner we can see that the material's wetting both edges very nicely there's good fusion good penetration so overall that's a pretty decent weld if we cut and etch that one we'd see that it were far from ideal so that's the only way really you can get an insight as to how well that the two sections have been welded together because sometimes visual don't tell you everything they might look good on the outside but you might not have actually penetrated into the corner at all and that's when you get a weak weld so briefly then i thought we'd talk about some troubleshooting but because i'm acutely aware of how long i've been talking now i'll reiterate a few points quickly covered and I'll add a few other simple mistakes just to be aware of. So as you've just seen, porosity is probably one of the most common problems in MIG welding. And it's always the result of some gas caught inside the weld metal. And nine times out of ten is because you haven't got enough shielding gas. So the first thing to do is check that you've got enough gas with your pea shooter or your uh, gas flow meter. And if there isn't enough, then just knock it up a little bit. But make sure that you're not already too high of a gas flow because that will cause you even more problems if you knock it up some more. The next thing to do is go along every joint between the bottle and the shroud. Make sure there's no leaks anywhere. A bit of soapy water, some link detector, spray every joint. You'll soon see if there's any leaks. Another thing is it could be drafts. If you've got the door slightly open or you've got a nice wind flow through your garage or even you're outside. It could be the fact that the wind is just blowing the shielding gas away. It's blowing air into your weld and creating your porosity. A few other considerations is the nozzle needs to be correctly sized for the torch. If it's too big, you might not be flowing enough shielding gas or your torch might not be able to flow enough shielding gas. So you knack it before you start there. You also need to keep everything in here clean because if anything contaminates the weld, then that will give you porosity. And there are a couple of other things to look out for such as dirty base material, excessive gun angle, so if it's blowing the shielding gas away from the weld, extending the wire too far out from the nozzle. As we've seen, we're all right up to about 40 millimetres, but that's not to say that you should do it. Half an inch, 10, 12 millimetres is about enough. Contaminated gas inside your cylinder. It's quite a rare one, that. Mainly affects TIG welding, but if you've got a contaminated gas mixture, then no matter what you do, you're going to get a porous weld. Another one to look out for is lack of fusion or cold lap. They're both slightly different things, these. 
lack of fusion being just the weld metal doesn't fuse or join or melt properly into the base or parent material or the bead behind it for that matter it's usually caused by incorrect gun angle or travel speed provided the settings are all correct because the settings are a big one it can also be caused by turning the settings too low just resulting in an overall lack of heat we proved that on a few of the earlier examples these ones here too low wire speed not enough heat so to rectify that then sort your settings out but as we've demonstrated you shouldn't need to touch your wire speed so it's probably a voltage issue if you've got your wire speed set right cold lap is essentially where too much material is piled into a weld and it just flows and runs uh, to the surrounding metal this specifically is cold lap so because we're moving too slowly there's too much heat it just well it just melted the weld material and it's run over the bead and just settled on the base material so that's not stuck that might as well just be blue tack if you run a whole weld like that you could break the two pieces apart no problem at all to sort this first of all sort your travel speed out provided your settings are correct because it could still be a settings issue obviously if you're running too much heat too much wire then it can run everywhere so sort, sort your travel speed out first and make sure your settings are properly sorted for the material that you're welding another common occurrence then is burn through and 90% of the time it only really affects thin material I was just playing with this a few weeks ago setting the welder up after I'd sorted the capacitors out this is some 6mm I think it is and I managed to burn through this so <laughs> I'm quite surprised how much power that welder's got to be fair but nine times out of ten you, you like one mil two mil plate sometimes three mil and all that is is because you're piling too much heat into the weld so what happens is the metal gets so hot that it just melts away and runs away and you end up with them quite a big hole then there are lots of thin metal welding techniques sometimes there's a back step you can do a small bead and then come back over the previous weld to keep the heat in the weld area where it's thicker lay another small bead come back or you can do a multitude of small runs or tacks just to try and keep the heat of the material down and of course high travel speeds or faster than normal travel speeds are recommended because then you can get away with a slightly higher welder settings so you can lay a nice bead down moving slightly faster than you would otherwise but still keeping the overall heat input lower than you would be if you were welding slower as said there's a lot of videos out there for thin metal techniques so definitely go and check some of them out if you're having difficulties welding it while i've got this plate out it brings us nicely onto the next problem which is excess spatter problem we've got with mig welding is it lends itself to quite a spattery process but there's a big difference between acceptable spatter and just pure excessive spatter if you compare this weld to this one We've got a couple of little BBs stuck there, but nothing too excessive. Whereas this one, they're absolutely everywhere. They're welded, properly welded on there. You won't be able to knock many of them off. So where do they come from? Well, nine times out of ten, it's the voltage or the travel speeds that are just too high. If we've set the wire speed correctly, you can still dial in the voltage just to get it in that sweet spot. And that's one telltale to it being too high is excessive spatter. Insufficient gas can be another one, so if you haven't got good gas coverage that also lends itself to blowing little BBs and spatter everywhere. The next most common one being dirty base material. This is filthy, I've not cleaned it, it's covered in rust and mill scale, so that'll be doing no favours. Or rusty weld wire, one that not many people think about, but if you've had a reel of welding wire and you've welded for three years, it's going to be rusty, guaranteed. If it's kept in garage, it's going to be rusty. And that's just going to produce welds like this. They're going to be spattery. Not ideal. And then finally, excessive wire stick out. If your shroud is too far away from the workpiece, then that can introduce spatter as well. But then that tends to be a problem with wire feed and voltage just brought on by too much electrical stick out. One more consideration being 
the consumables that's in the torch. Make sure your shroud's not filthy inside, keep it nice and clean. Keep the contact tip nice and clean and make sure it's not excessively warm because if you're feeding a lot of wire through, if you're not getting a good contact in there, then that can lead to problems with spatter as well. So I've brought you back into the machine. We want to have a look at the wire feed assembly because there are a couple of issues that can rear its head from this area. Biggest one being the correct wire tension. As I said earlier, this is sprung loaded so that it clamps the roller onto the wire at the right tension. But you need to get that right. And there's a way to generally set the tension of the wire and get it about right. So one thing you can do is get your torch, get your wire, set your wire feed in and just pinch the wire. And if you can stop that from coming out just or just not quite stopping from coming out, then that's about the right tension. The other thing you can do is press the wire, press the trigger when the torch is up against, say, the workbench, and if you just feel it, come back slightly and then stop feeding, then that's the correct tension. Adjust to suit if it's either too much or too little. But I mean, again, as I mentioned earlier, the rollers have got grooves in, so you need to make sure that the right groove is selected for the right thickness of wire. Normally you'll have two settings, you might have a 0 0.6 and a 0 0.8 groove. So if you're running anything different, then you need to buy a different roller. So lastly then, general pore welding or pore starting. This could be a thousand things unfortunately, including any of the already mentioned troubleshooting items. Well the first thing to check is that you've got a good earth close to the point of welding. If your bench is earthed, the material on the bench might be contaminated, dirty, so you're not going to get a very good contact between the workpiece and the bench, which means you're not going to get a very good flow of electricity through there. So my biggest recommendation is to give your workpiece a good clean up and then earth directly to the workpiece. That's going to give you your best chance. You might find that the first couple of welds are difficult to get going and then you're all right after that. But that could just be the fact that the workpiece has welded itself to the bench because it's been arcing or it's not been touching properly or it's contaminated and it finally finds a good earth and then sticks itself to the workbench. Again, far from ideal it's because you've clamped to the workbench and not cleaned everything up properly. So again, just earth directly to the workpiece. We'll find a nice clean area. The mill scale and the rust isn't going to do any favours like this one. We spent a bit of time properly cleaning that one. Well, laid some nice welds in there. This one didn't get cleaned up at all and the welds are pretty nasty to be fair. So give everything a good clean. Give yourself the best chance. Okay, so I think that about covers everything. I've chosen to not literally cover every fine little detail that goes into it because the video needs to be a week long. And I'm sure everyone is sick of hearing me now. I'm sick of talking myself. So you're definitely fed up with me as well. I think I've mentioned most of the points that even the most green beginner is going to need to get started. And there's probably a few in there that the seasoned hobbyist can make use of as well. Obviously, the welder settings are referenced to a transformer-based machine where you don't have the beauty of actual figures to work from. Although all the techniques are transferable across machines, those are with inverter machines you can just set and go if it's fully synergic. We don't have the beauty, so that's why we've gone into detail about how to actually set. It wouldn't be a bad thing just to check, to be honest. If you had an inverter machine, it certainly wouldn't harm just to fire a bit of wire out and just see what it's actually sending out. I really hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you've taken some top tips and some good info away from it. So from the Yorkshire Fab Shop, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.